this topic is going to be very, very interesting, and we'll all look forward to it. And so without further ado, Jan and Vinod. Thank you. Thank you, Sri. Um, OK, perfect. Um, thank you, Sri, for the kind introduction. My talk is going to be talking about H2O for marketing and uh, CRM applications. I hope you have learned a lot how to use the H2O, both the web GUI as well as the R um, environments as well. And uh, after learning how to use the tool, the second step is naturally we need to get some ROI out of using the tool and to solve real business problems. So um, marketing and CRM applications is, um, I will give you some um, interesting examples and then we will try to realize more ROIs out of it. First, uh, this will be the summary. And uh, when you talk about uh, um, all the big data machine learning platforms, you will want, want to say, why H2O? You may already get a sense of uh, what uh, H2O can do. I, I will give a brief um, summary over here. Next, I will talk about some marketing CRM applications, very general, and uh, maybe you have used and you will be using in the future. After that, I will use the KDD Cup 1998 data as an example to run through this example to show you how H2 make this, um, solving this problem so easily, and, uh, and uh, that we'll have some fun there. After then we will come back and uh, to talk about uh, why H2 again. And I will make a fun announcement after that, then we will continue to do some hands-on and training as well. So that will be my first half. After that, Vinod is going to um, give you a very interesting, more modern marketing examples as well. So look forward to that. So we had uh, talks from um, Cliff talking about uh, um, our key value um, pairs and uh, how we do the compression, how h works at a very, very lower level. And uh, we uh, have a Tom talk about the environments, as well as uh, Patrick and Arnold, they talk about the, how to really run and use H2O to, to solve problems. So basically, H, you, I, I think you must have already got a taste of what H2O can do. I think it's a fantastic big data machine learning platform. It's, a fast, it's a faster, it's bigger, and it's better. Faster in terms of you can really, in a moment, we will show how fast it can solve our problems um, in minutes than hours or days compared to um, using other tools, say RM. And as well, it's bigger, you can address, you know, solve a problem with the bigger data sets and with the cluster mode. And it's better. We have a lot of very good um, sampling tools as well as we have a very good um, algorithm implemented. So the, then that's back to the marketing and the CRM applications. Why we wanted to bring this topic, this type of applications here is, um, of course, I spent years at Marketo, that's a marketing software companies. And, and not only that, but also because marketing is become the frontier of machine learning. Um, why that be, recently, we, people are, well, Basically, with the software, with the technology, we will be able to track customers so well. And there are millions, mountains of customer behavior data coming into play. And in order to really create the best customer experience, the customer relationship management, ranging from marketing, sales, and support, is created the complete customer journey. Any companies, if you go to not only B2B, but B2C, they always wanted to make it more customer-centric so that it, the customer will have the very coherent experience. And in the meantime, and I think our company is also integrating the information and the data from the different departments so that they can really um, extract more intelligence out of it create a more business value. That's where I think H2O wants to do a lot to create a disruptive um, business advantage for your business. And uh, so if you are in marketing or marketing relevant uh, fields, you must have known the funnel, the marketing funnel from the very brand awareness and go on to nurturing and so on to the deals closed. 
And here I consider, um, I created some funnel similar to that, but I would depict it as, I would call it um, customer relationship funnel built on the intelligent CRM applications. So at the very top level, there are very uh, awareness still. We want to do a lot of things like uh, ad targeting. And those are the very interesting business problem that the applications where big data predict and this big data machine learning will have fun um, can play a very big role. And for example, Yahoo is doing that. That's, you know, on the left, that just shows some example of the companies who are doing that kind of um, um, work and trying to solve the problems. The next stage is for discovery and so on. There's um, keyword bidding. There's also where um, big data machine learning have been used a lot. And in fact, uh, Vena's problems is related to AdWord uh, and real-time bidding. Yeah, and after that, um, it's a, a very generic problem. When they, we, we, after you get the prospect's names, get the lead's name, the next step you want to see who should we contact, how to contact, and at what time to contact. That's the very generic lead scoring problem. Um, this is a very um, active field, actually. Quite a few companies are working on that, and the, the, they are trying to build lead scoring for not only B2B, enterprises, B2B companies, as well as the B2C and e-commerce company as well. And it's very closely related to lead scoring problems that are related to recommendation and foreca forecast. So um, they will, for example, for Amazon's case, after they have a customer, they already have a customer's purchase history, they want to know for the what item or what uh, merchan merchandise we should recommend to the customer. And for eBay, similar. And uh, for Macy's, maybe they are based on a customer's purchase history, they want to make the recommendation as well. And uh, then they want also, in the meantime, based on all of those, so we want to, the companies would like to maximize the overall um, lifetime value as well as their um, overall portfolio, I, I think, a profit. So um, why do I think this? Can, uh, why I would like to call it a customer relationship funnel is it's becoming actually more important after you close the deal, after you got the customer, you want to go further to do more, so in, incorporating more information from support and the references and retention as well. So that's a, a lot of a churn analysis as well. And especially in SaaS Business, I believe, a churn analysis have been very popular in mobile and, uh, and in and, um, kind of like TV, radio channels, and so on. And uh, I think the next relatively emerging new field is the loyalty. How to run those loyalty program to better do cross sell and to upsell. So basically, all those are very interesting problems. I think where big data machine learning methodologies will bring great insights and uh, value into, to, into this and uh, to help solve the problem. So um, the example I'm going to use here is a KDD Cup 1998 example. So basically the example is they are um, a, non, a charity organization. They are trying to maximize their profit from their um, direct mailing campaigns. So what the data set is, this is relatively kind of like a, a little bit old fashioned that at maybe in 1998 is a um, digital marketing was not that popular yet. So a lot of information mainly related with the direct mailing. So um, we'll have, we will have the training set, which contains um, over 90,000 rows of samples and uh, uh, over 480 attributes. That is over the, will be the columns. There will be two target variables, and target B, which is um, zero and one, indicates whether we are, they will donate or not. Target D will indicate how much they have, they will, they will donate. And there will, uh, we will also have a test data set, which contains um, over 96,000 rows, and about, a, I, I did a little kind of like a clean up on the columns, so we got about, a, still around 480 attributes. So, and the cost for each mail to send out, you know, plus the people who process the mails as well as the postage and, and so on, so it's considered as a 68. Um, 
I did also did a little pro pre-processing of the data so that it and reduced the cardinality. Um, I would do, I would like to run the hands-on after this, so let's quickly go through the results. Um, I want to do the result to make a comparison. And the on the left column is how traditionally people would do it in R. On the right columns, I will show you how to do it successfully and this shows how easy it can be done actually in H2O. First, read data. Read data part, um, quickly if you, um, we will later on show that uh, R is slower, H2O actually when you do H2O that in part file, it's really fast. And the second of all, in R mostly, I, it cannot handle that data very well directly. And uh, of course, I also created a data set with just uh, selected features. Uh, which I have done work, so you can use them directly. And I reduced the columns from 481 to 64 columns, so is that it can be um, right into R easily and run. However, when we run, if we run the random forest package, oops, you will see very well. If you have used that before, you will tell that um, our random forest cannot handle missing value and categorical val um, variables with 32, more than 32 levels. So you will run into a problem very quickly. We see an error message say there are too many missing values. And if you are going to use the party package and try to run the C forest, it will run, into, run out of memory quickly easy as well. And uh, um, I will, but in uh, H2O, we can go through the steps. It's to, anyone pretty much can do it once you get familiar with the uh, UI. And then quickly we'll show you the big, um, big data random forest. We can get the result right away. And uh, um, to show that we can make the, re the prediction can help us produce the profit of um, about 14,000 and uh, $500, it's out of the box solution, which actually can rank about a num number three in the KDD Cup data competition. So I think that's pretty good, compa especially compared to the number one um, profit, which is only 14,700. Mm, these are the code, so um, you will have them in the MD file as well, in a moment we'll run them. So I will quickly come back to the summary of this, you know, why H2O. You learn H2O, you have looked into the problem you want to solve, and you want, we want to solve the problem uh, fast. H2O can do that with great in-memory process, and it's also JVM optimized, I think. And Tom, in his talk, has really presented this part of, um, very well. And, the, and it can handle bigger. We have a Cliff, our co-founder and the CTO, who's an expert of Java on all aspects. And so he does the compression. So in general, we do compression pretty well for any data. If we write into um, H2O, we can get about a 50 to a 100-fold um, compression. And uh, it is also massively scalable. Um, it's better. We have a very be best-in-class algorithm. We have a wonderful people and deep learning guy, Arno, and our Thomas, young person, as well as our, our expert, Patrick, and so on, and uh, um, other very amazing people. So they make this part of very great. So, um, so now you understand the product as well as the data set I'm going. I want to challenge you. I have learned about H2O. And I want to tell you see if you want to participate in an H2O award mini competition hosted by um, H2O. The goal is to use our H2O platform to build a predictive models with the data sets I just mentioned, and, like, and to predict how much profit can be generated, how many mails to send. So it, it will be a very short one. So we can, the deadline, I think, will be December 15, 2014. And the winner will be announced that Friday. We have a, we'll, the top winner will get an iPad Air too. I hope that you will like it. Um, so of course, the winning model expected to generate the most profit on the test data set uh, among all the candidates. And the profit is also expected to be at least 
14,500. And as well as, of course, when you build a model, please do not use those um, target, two target variables at the same time. And uh, we expect each um, contestant can have a, um, three chances to submit their um, work, which it would include uh, scripts, parameters, settings, versions of H O E are using, as well as um, the profit number, um, the amount of mails, the number of mails you, you are going to send, and so on. So we will post the details of this mini competition on our website, please um, stay tuned. So now I'm going to do what I'm, you know, I, I'm having right now is just the, the page you're seeing over there. And uh, I have a run few. For you, you can just go to, um, I believe you have all started um, H2O session already. Let's do another one. So basically, that's the H2O. You go to the data, do upload, select file, and uh, I'm going to do learn on the learning data set. It will upload very fast. And I'm not doing much work at all. I'm just clicking. And it's, the data set is being parsed. Give it a moment. And carp 98 lrn underscore z. So you will see we have the data set here. And uh, basically here on the screen, basically what you need to do is uh, go to the data, click upload or import files if you know the directory, then click on the data set. Then, so we get here, and I, I noticed we, there have been a few questions asked about uh, you know, whether we can change the data type. I'm just okay. Show you, I can easily change up even loading the um, loading the data. I'm just uh, going to make a few changes on the data types, um, about uh, several columns. The first um, view, it's very easy. I think for this, even um, CMO can do it. <laughs> So I'm just uh, um, converting the first seven columns to um, categorical variables. So that's after we loaded one data set. You can see the UI actually is pretty nice for this. You can first, uh, this uh, light yellow panel of the table shows the, like the summary of all the data set. You can see them, easily see all of them by scrolling the Bar, yeah. What, oh, where is the data file? Okay. Uh, so go to here. Do you have this? Yeah, go to the folder, H2O training. Yeah. There should be. Uh, just a moment. A file system. Where is it? Uh, I had it just a moment. I have, I'm losing. Uh, our training databases. Yeah, that folder. Sorry, I direct you to the wrong folder. Over here, under the red button. Then you click use cases, you will be able to see the three data sets we have here. Okay. So then let's bring back the web UI here easily. We have loaded the very first data set and it has been parsed. Then Let's build a model on this. 
I'm going to build a big random forest, big data. So I Oh, it's okay. And do, are you here? Can you see this? Uh, do you see the folder called the training data set? It's right here. Okay, one, double click on this. See if you can see a folder called the use cases. There should be eight folder. No, this is on v VM, and it's also available on IC3 if you need, yeah. But, so you, you would come through the, the browse on the H2O interface, right? So when you do that, you can't see the yeah, stuff necessarily. So, so if I go here, I select file. Oh, open the view. Oh, you're, you're too far down. Okay. You want to, go up to, the view. You want to open. Root, okay. Okay. Okay, got it. So, okay. Home, even higher. Okay, file system. No, he, okay. he's saying he does not have data, cannot see the data sets. Yeah. Hmm. I thought we saw this. Can you see the data now? I think they found it. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just go show the steps. Very easy. Go to data, choose upload. You basically need to, don't need to do anything. Then select data. Then this directly may not show directly, but uh, you can always go to the lab and uh, to find it. Go to file system. I'll show the directly. I see your problem. Yeah. File system, mm, data, H2O training. I'm showing the step by step UX cases, uh, use cases, and then learn. Make sense now? Oh, yeah. The path is correct. So, do you, I, I, yeah, I forgot to mention here, while well, after you click the upload, a window will pop up. Go to the look at the very left panel, and there is a folder called file system. Then go through that chart. File system, data, h two training, use cases, then you will see the data. So I'll load it again. <laughs> Give me a hold. I just loaded it again, so very easy. I'm not doing anything. That data has loaded. Good, all good, yes. Submit, parse. So I have uploaded this file a couple of times, so it's automatically assigned um, the data name to after that, yeah, so. And I'm not going to do the um, transform the data tab for those columns anymore. I, would, I, I know I'm going to do the full, yeah. So you can do it on your own. Then let's do a model building. Go to random forest. I'm going to give it a name, big data, data random forest, two, one, yeah. And the source. Uh, for the source, of, that means the data you just uh, uploaded. Remember the name? It's cup. I have a rent uh, down there for a couple of times. So I'm going to use Z1. I know Z2 is the one I just uploaded, but I did not do the transform for the data um, column types. So I'm going to use Z1. And response, response variable, I'll choose um, target D. For ignore, for ignore the columns, I'm not going to do much, actually. I'm just to scroll down to almost the bottom. You will see a column, two columns called Control N and the Target B. You push a Shift and go down. I want to ignore those. They are because it's giving you too much in information. And keep going. 
I'm not doing anything. Here, the number of trees, steps, and all of those. So I would like to just take it as a default and run a quick random forest to see what we can get. Yeah, it transformed pretty much the first seven from uh, numerical vi um, variables to factor. There's a button called S factor or S integer, you can change it. Yeah. Then submit. Here, basically the very top here, the poll and it indicate gives you the, shows the progress the algorithm is running. And we can see we are doing a regression. It shows a mean squared error. And you can also see the number of trees is being generated and the MSE we have so far. So we asked it to build 50 trees and I have a uploading lot, and in just a few seconds, we are getting almost 10 trees. So basically, I have run this so many, tested so many times, so you can finish building the uh, model in about a, one minute. In while it's building, um, you can see the MSC. If something went wrong, you did not like, you, for example, think that MSC is too big, I want to stop it. You can, there's a button over here. You can see you can stop training the model. You can do early stop. And it also very nicely gave you the um, tree stats right uh, on the second table. So, and I think for our model right now, we can see model is building nicely the at least the MSC is getting smaller and smaller as we are having more trees. We're almost there. And maybe when you get the time and uh, at home, uh, you may want to try, see if how fast you can read this whole data set in R, and also see how you can try to build a random forest in R. And uh, you will see, you will feel the comparison significantly. Yeah, you will see that. Um, And in the meantime, um, I think you can minimize this browser and uh, maybe open your R Studio. I already have one opened. And yeah, you can go to File, Open File. Oops. And then go to um, H2O on the left panel, go to H2O training and the tutorials. And go to marketing use cases. And there is an MD file. So it will show you uh, from the beginning what you will do if you want to run in R, and I also created the feature, uh, selected the features for you to play around if you'd like. Mm -hmm. And let's see the results. So I'm not going to, given the time, maybe I'm not going to run the R part completely, but uh, you're welcome to play around uh, when you get a chance. So I'm going to minimize the R Studio window and then open the browser. I believe the tree, the model is built. It's right here. Okay, and the next we want to score, but then I realized, oh, I forgot to upload the validation data set. So I will go there and uh, update my validation data set. Of course, if you ha your data set, if you want to do split, I think uh, our, um, my colleagues have uh, shown you how to do that. You can upload and uh, it parse. 
I think I ha I'm having too many things running over there. Similarly, I'm going to um, change the data type for um, for date, for T code, for zip. A DOB. So see, I can change this on the fly. And then cluster. And it's, so I want to be the data types for each column to be consistent with the um, data set that I used to build this model. Now let's go to score and predict. I think I named my model as DRF1. I have a DRF that's some, um, I built before. And then we want to score it on the validation data set, right? You see it consistently. And uh, I'm going to give it name, give the prediction name. Uh, Kitchen one, I want to consistent. So let us go. Oh, yeah. Here I noticed, um, remember to submit, sometimes it's not that sensitive to the click. We now have the result, the prediction here. And there are several ways you can do it, and uh, in R, actually what I have just done in Web UI can all be done in H2OR. Um, even though it's in, we are using R Studio, using that environment, but everything, every implementation actually were done in H2O by H2O people. It's not done by R. So let's see. I'm going to save this file. Okay. Remember, we have our R Studio open. And uh, I already have my empty file here. I have all the scripts and uh, you should have there. So I have run a lot, so, you know, run this example and while I was sitting back there. So I'm going to do it here. I'm going to remove all the list. Okay. And then on your MD file, oh, okay. Where we got, to, we need to read the, set of that, read the file. Here I'm just using simple R command. So you will notice actually reading this validation file, it takes uh, uh, some time, uh, um, about 10 or 20 seconds. But if you are going to run this in H2O in R, the import files part is very fast. I think it can be, um, if this takes 10 seconds, that's just two seconds. Yeah. And um, I'm going to do, and this. So basically here, I'm just going to use the prediction and compute how much profit I can generate after this. I'm double checking the files I'm creating. And um, so here you will see we are going to calculate the, the profit first. And we got the number, which is um, 14,219 dollars. And uh, the maximum donation we can get from this um, direct mail campaign will be about uh, um, $500. Actually, if you remember um, um, to inspect the data sets we have, we'll see actually the maximum amount. So we can get from uh, historical data is also around 500. And then let's see how much we can, how many mails we need to send out. It's about 50,000. That's really good. So basically here we are using a very simple example to illustrate how easy actually H2O as big data machine learning platform to help you justify, yeah, marketing. I'm spending the money and I direct only mail to about a half of the people and I can generate a very good ROI out of it. Okay, this is my talk. If you have any questions, we can answer at the end. And uh, I'm going to pass the baton to Vinod. Hi, um, Vinod Iyengar. I work currently with Actors. Um, I was previously with a company called Rushcard, which is a prepaid debit card. Um, and Actors, 
we are building a product called On Demand Payroll. Um, well, between both the companies, the problems which I was trying to solve with our team was uh, you know, mainly with uh, marketing, uh, digital acquisitions, uh, lead scoring, uh, figuring out lifetime value for customers. Um, all the stuff which uh, Jan showed, and in addition, we also did a lot of risk modeling, um, finding out attrition analysis, churn analysis, and um, predicting customer service issues as well. Um, so these are like a bunch of problems we are trying to solve. Um, and I'm going to talk about one particular problem here, which is scoring of leads. Um, and also, main, mainly as to what a tool like H2O lets us do as compared to what previously people are doing. Um, scoring of leads, it's a very old problem. Uh, people have been doing it forever. Um, traditionally, what we do is we, when uh, someone signs up, you have certain data points which are available about the customer. Um, we use that to, and then append some additional data points. Um, often we get demographic data from uh, third party sources or other uh, vendors, you know? And then you use that to score and then assign a value. And then based on that value, you can do further upselling or uh, you, know, you can provide them offers or you can make sure, you know, try to make sure that the customer stays on with you, um, more to do with attention and attrition. Um, the part of the reason was that because you didn't have enough data at the time of sign up. So uh, especially with the early advent of web, uh, the amount of data available was very limited. So you could only build, have so much intelligence as to who this customer is and how likely is this customer going to be you know, a profitable one at the end of it. So um, what now we have, uh, that's what I want to talk about, is um, with, the, with a lot of data which is available currently, you could use this to do real-time bidding, programmatic uh, buying, which um, now is like a big thing. Uh, and what programmatic buying essentially is, you know, um, use you know, real-time systems and rules and algorithms to score and change the bids and also the targeting uh, real-time based on the d traffic you're getting. So uh, with a platform like H2O or even other sorts of things, like, you, know, you can actually score these leads real-time so you can change your bids, change your targeting, do all of that real time to get a lot more optimization in your marketing efforts. Um, so, uh, well, even with uh, programmatic and real time bidding, what companies are doing mostly is optimizing for conversion. So, if, for example, um, you could optimize for your top end, like some, sign, someone signing up or installing your mobile app, for example. That could be a conversion event. Um, and the problem I want to solve today, look at, is can we solve for optimizing for the lifetime? Um, and the lifetime value could, you know, uh, give us a different set of optimizing parameters. And let's see what, what are the data points we have at this point. So at the time of sign up, um, what's really available is your web browsing data, uh, the number of pages visited in the app or the website, uh, time spent on the site, um, the source of the lead, uh, which is which uh, marketing channel or network the source came from. Um, any additional touch points. Um, anyone who's doing marketing attribution would have all the data as well. You have the different touch points which the user came from. Um, time of the day, day of the week, all kind of, that kind of stuff. Uh, in addition, with uh, IP address location, you could uh, map it, match it with the zip code statistics to get all the census data, the median income, demographic, demographic breakup, race, gender, breakup for the area which the customer is coming from time zone and employment rates, all that stuff. So this gives a nice additional uh, uh, a rich set of you know, uh, data points to score, um, traditionally where you didn't have a lot of information at the time of sign up. Now we have a lot more information, use that and see if we can predict better. Um, this particular example, which uh, we did at uh, Rashkard, uh, we had these additional data points. So we actually had a survey where we asked the users, um, where did they hear about the product? What is the main reason for signing up for the product? Uh, what are the use cases for the product? Uh, and these data points, survey answers, became very important for us. Uh, they were highly predictive of future use. Um, in addition, we also had the product which is selected. So for example, um, in this case, they had a range of debit cards, different categories, different fee plans, and all those became important inputs for the model. Um, uh, in addition, for financial services, you also have something called as uh, KYC, which is know your customer. This basically requires any financial company which is doing money transfer of any kind to get um, verification of the user. So we have to confirm that the user is who he or she claims to be. So you have 
Um, so you have the traditional vendors, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian, who do the scoring. And the results they provide also has a lot of interesting uh, data elements which could be used for scoring. Um, and as I said, additional vendors from like vendors like Rapleaf um, uh, and uh, Axiom can provide a lot more data as well, which uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys are already using. So in this particular data set, we have about 70 actual features, and then by baking those, a um, lot of those uh, uh, categorical variables, we broke them into separate individual variables. Um, and this is something I used to do uh, before, um, and uh, you probably don't need fetch tour because this is so fast. For if you're running it on R or SPSS, so which uh, as I used to do, uh, it helped break into categories, and that way the model started faster. When you're trying to predict the likelihood of profitability, um, in this case, we'll use a simple uh, categorical uh, zero one binary variable, but I, we could do multi category variables as well, and you could also build cost functions to uh, optimize for profitability, um, uh, pay, you know, give more weightage to a profitable outcome as compared to an unprofitable one. So, um, the pre processing, what we did in this one. Um, the entire data came from a warehouse, so um, the web tracking piece, of course, as you know, has, could have a, would have a lot of missing values. Um, it is quite spotty, um, so that's something which uh, we had to work with, and uh, there are ways to do it, and one way is maybe put all the missing values into a separate group and then see if there is any predictability to that. Um, often it isn't, but uh, it's one easy, convenient way to do it. Um, the con variables like age and uh, always a question of categorizing, breaking them into bins comes up. Um, increasingly, it seems like there, it's not a good idea anymore. Um, used to be helpful previously because if you, you were running it on older um, like platforms like R or SPSS, uh, just speeds up your analysis. Um, in this case, the dependent variable uh, have two. Um, one is called activated, which basically means a certain event in the lifetime where the customer does an activity and after that point, the customer becomes profitable for us. And direct deposit is a case where, as it suggests, someone direct deposits their uh, paycheck onto the card. That is a very profitable outcome as well. So these are two profitable events for us. Um, and you could do a combination of the two. I'm just going to run with activation as activated as the dependent variable here. And as I said, you could also have a cost function. You could um, uh, either use values of those outcomes and use that to build a, maybe a composite function or even separate you know, cost functions to uh, improve your model. Um, so one of the things which changed for us uh, since we started using H2O is we, uh, you know, instead of spending a lot of time cleaning and pre-processing, we were like, let's just build the models first and see. Um, the approach changes. Um, you don't have to sample a whole lot more. You can just take a big data set with the errors, with its you know, warts and all, and let it tell you what, you know, uh, get a good sense of what, how the data is, and then use that to then do your pre-processing. Uh, so the steps sort of change. Um, uh, in models, I mean, um, so we actually are using a, a logistic regression model, but you could, you know, the, uh, one of the benefits is you can just try all these models and see which, get a sense of uh, which, what works, and, and it's also very easy to change all the parameters uh, so trial and error becomes very easy. So um, you know, throw it around, play around with it to get you know all the interesting scenarios. Um, okay. All right. So I'm gonna just pull up a data, the data set and we'll see how it performs. So this is the data set. Uh, H2O underscore rush underscore new data set. Is it okay? It's the same folder as the one Yan was using. So it's picking up everything. I'm going to just pause it. Okay. So let's take a look at the way, you know. Uh, so we have all the, the months, month of the application split up into different variables. You have uh, these different uh, web analytics, you know, data, data sets which are, uh, these factors are coming from web analytics basically, um, what the user did at different points. Um, uh, and then you have the zip codes, top 50, bottom. Uh, uh, these are the, all the zip code statistics which are coming in over here. Um, 
And this is the, these are the survey results which I talked about. So we had a questionnaire at the time of sign up for the user. So these were uh, coming from the responses to that. Um, let's see, mention day of the week. Uh, and then, uh, these are all the uh, places where the user came from. Um, if they used any promo codes, the and then uh, which source they came from, incent or uh, display or email or uh, you know whatever the marketing source that brought the user, that became a factor as well. Um, and then yeah, these are all the zip code statistics. Uh, it tells you the per uh, percentage of races, demographics, all those in, uh, all those things become useful data points as well. Uh, median age, male, female, uh, divisions, and all that. Okay, and then you have, yeah, uh, percentage of different races as well. So yeah, let's, let's see, let's just take a simple model. Um, do random forest first, call it uh, marketing model one. And data set is picked here. The response variable uh, here. Yeah. yeah, so this is the response variable. Um, okay, in the ignored columns, I'm gonna ignore the other response variable first, of course. And these are all my old uh, prob uh, probabilities which came from my previous old model, so I'm gonna remove these as well. Uh, no. okay. uh, um, to speed it up, maybe, you know, let's do 20 trees. Instead of all 50, and I'm gonna leave everything else as it is. So in this case, um, in this uh, data set, the total number of uh, ones, the activated ones are only 3,000 out of 100 cases. So only about 3% of the cases are positive. Are, so you'll see that the models tend to predict, you know, even if I predict everything is zero, you'll still get a 97% accuracy rate. Obviously, that's not very useful for us. Um, and that's where, uh, so here, here's an example. Um, Right, so it predicted uh, only it got only 820 of the ones as ones. So uh, it's uh, the thresholds are something. In it. So you you have then can play around with the thresholds to see. Um, this is where sort of the art of data science comes into play, I guess, uh, where uh, see which parameters work well, which classifications work well, and that also is becomes an important uh, thing to try out. So uh, different classifications, for example. Uh, will give you different results. And that's something you can try or play around with. Uh, this is where a cost function will be helpful too, because you want to uh, give more weight to this outcome, these two outcomes instead of these ones. Um, uh, for example, if this were a risk model, then I would try to optimize to get more ones as possible. I, I don't care if I do a lot of false positives. Um, I can work with false positives, but I would like to optimize the, the risk, uh, the actual risk uh, outcomes. Um, so it's one, and then um, so the one which I did uh, on this one was um, GLM. Uh, okay. Come on, come on. I'm gonna 
this is the other dependent variable, so I'm just going to ignore that. Um, and the one thing which affects the family here becomes binomial, which is basically logistic regression. So it's nice because it gives a formula which you can plug in directly. Uh, and if you are scoring real time, you can use this formula to like start scoring and you know, create models real time and score them as well. Yeah. Oh, that's quick. So it found an optimal solution. As you can see, you can again uh, try out the different classification criteria um, to see which one fits well. Um, and this is where you, uh, with a tool like H2O, you can keep trying out different outcomes to see which, whatever, you know, uh, the, what are the right parameters for you, um, for your own business case and solution. Uh, that's pretty much it. I had you guys have any questions uh, for those? So no? any questions for either of our speakers? So in this case, you don't use uh, any feature engineering. You does not do any feature engineering work. Is that correct? Uh, pardon me, I, I can get you. Do Do you do any feature engineering or not? Uh, did a little bit. Um, I just want to demo the the ease of you know taking out a lot of features and then throwing it in. Um, uh, you could you know do a lot of you know uh, uh, part of the pre-processing. You could do a little, little bit of engineering, but in this case, I didn't do much. Okay, so I think one of the one thing really come up to my mind is how we change the you know mindset. Like the, you know, I have been using like doing data science like use SAS, you know, those type of tools mm -hmm. for years. And the one of the things I do is basically I can do the feature engineering myself or you know, step by step. Mm -hmm. With these kind of tools, mm -hmm. one thing is like how do I change myself? Because the tool is kind of a black box in right. a lot of cases, right? So how we change the mindset, you know, to adapt to this kind of new tools, that is something, you know, what, or another question might be to think about this is what is the best practice for this type of things? Right, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, from, you know, I, I've been on both sides, uh, being a data scientist and also being a marketer. Um, and you're right, you know, as a marketer, you don't traditionally like black box models. You don't, you know, you feel like uh, there's some voodoo magic going on and you don't know what's happening. So, but I think with, Tools like this, uh, because it's easy to like try and fail quickly, uh, you can throw the model in and then um, see the results to, for yourself. And uh, the time to build the model and test it is very shortened. So we were able to like build multiple models within a day and run them and then see improved results. So for example, whenever we used to bring in a new marketing channel, um, a new affiliate vendor, where we had no data on that vendor, for example, um, and you're talking about uh, you know, 100,000 know, 100, leads coming in a single hour, for example. And we want, that's the time when we're spending a lot of money already, so we want to score something real time and see if it's working. So uh, in that scenario, I'm okay going with the black box model as long as I have the speed going in. So I can build the model, test it, and see, get a good sense of this is worthwhile or not. Um, so I think uh, it's a gradual change from marketer's perspective, you know, to ad accept these new tools and the new, you know, modeling paradigms where you don't necessarily see what's happening, uh, the hidden layers are, the features are, but you accept what's happening. So I hope that answered the question. Anyone else? But, mm, oh. I actually put dynamic a big data run for seeing our, um, I have this, yeah. In our um, product, there is a, fe I, I think one feature we did not mention, stress a lot, but it's, can be very useful, so we should show the feature importance while you are building the model. Actually, you will be able to see the different features, how important, how much information they actually can provide to you. So a lot of the, for example, random forest is not a totally a black box. We just make it look too easy mm -hmm. that you think it's, yeah, actually there, if you look into the log, look into many of those, you can see exactly how they are. But like logistic regression, it's very easy to see the parameters. You know which features are the most important ones. And I guess with, uh, so if you have like a feature selection, you know? Yeah. You can yeah, see that in random forest too. I, I think, yeah, feature selection is, 
Im this important and impart, important part in statistics, and yeah. many people still do that. Do I, I think this is just simplified. If you have even more, this is just helps you to maybe do stuff. I, I think random forest is the beauty of that, especially in marketing. It's marketing data, unlike a finance data, unlike a, um, credit data, unlike many other operations data. It's very dirty. It's very dirty, a lot of missing um, values and a lot of categorical variables. It's so many, uh, uh, it's many, many um, algorithms may not work that well, but the random forest is quite resilient in this case. And uh, um, so it's very useful and uh, you can gain, first of all, by getting, reading the data and uh, get the summary. After the data passed, you can get a very good in terms of mean, max, and the, um, the, the cardinality and so on. Then you build a quick, you can quickly do build a very simple model, then look at the feature importance, then maybe start from there and for do small things on feature selection and so on, yeah. Make it better. So that's why I want to actually bring back to this uh, competition. We have this data set here, which is Which is, um, am I losing my the screen? Sorry. <laughs> I'm making our AV team work very hard. <laughs> Switch screens, thank you. So yeah, that's why we wanted to, there, basically I'm showing how easy to use the product to get a decent or reasonable solution. But we want to be better. We want a better ally. Your boss may also ask you to you know, show me a better solution. But that's where you want to for the explore and to see how well, how, you know, the play with the features, the play with the different uh, um, parameters to get a better result. So that's why we wanted to um, engage the community and to participate in this effort and uh, do more. Well, this will be me. You can do it, you know, we set the time range to be within a month. So we'll see this results very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Any questions from the audience? I know it's getting a little just intense. One, just, one um, just one question. Oh, so I'm a, it's clear that you can get really great business insights from building these type of models. You, just by looking at the structure of the model, you learn something about how your vendors are performing mm -hmm. and how you can allocate your marketing budget. I'm curious if you um, implemented scoring from these models in any automated way, and if you could talk about that and what type of business impact you could have by by using the scores that you get from the models. Yeah, uh, so one use case which we did um, was um, we had a, uh, this vendor called uh, Efficient Frontier, I don't know if you know them, uh, Adobe bought them. So they were offering a real-time uh, bidding platform for search, uh, both on Google and Bing. Um, so we scored this model and then we were sending those results real-time uh, within with like a five or 10 minute lag uh, to change the bids for keywords. And we had a really long like, tail of keywords, uh, I'm talking about like seven to 8,000 keywords in like individual campaigns. Um, so we were playing with the bids and um, we got um, improvement in an efficiency of about 25, 30% just out of the box uh, by implementing a, by playing real time bidding. Um, and that's just one example. And, and now I think with uh, almost every display or uh, uh, affiliate vendor provides you know, programmatic buying as well, all the big ones at least. So you could implement something like this, and uh, you could you can see efficiencies coming up real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Vinod.